Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short. Lovely to see some familiar faces, as always. BIC is a neutral and inclusive platform for informed conversations, arts, and culture. We're a privately enabled public space, and with your support, we host close to 500 events a year. All our events are free and open to all. Please go to our website or follow us on Instagram to find out all the various events we have. And before we begin our session today, I request you to please take a moment to put your cell phones on silent or switch them off entirely if you can manage that. Today, we are in session two of our three series masterclass, Wildlife Science with Pragmatism, where we'll be exploring practicing wildlife conservation which will look at the complexities in actually managing conserving species, bringing them back, or managing conflict with humans. As a country of 1.3 billion people, races towards development. There are a lot of myths and misconceptions about conservation which we hope to clear today, and we are really privileged that Dr. Laskaran, with his decades of work, and with uh, Mr. Dilip Kumar and Mr. Muthanna, are here with us today to share the wealth of experience in this very, very important topic. Today's uh, session will be started off by a talk by Dr. Karanth, followed by a conversation between him and Mr. Dilip Kumar and Mr. Mutana, followed by audience q and I'll take a quick moment to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Ulas Karanth originally trained as an engineer and pursued his passion for wildlife biology, later obtaining a master's degree from the University of Florida and a PhD from Mangalore University. His long-term research on the ecology of tigers led to the expertise in carnivore ecology, as well as in conservation biology and policy. Dr. Karanth is Emeritus Director at the Center for Wildlife Studies, Fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences and holds adjunct professorships at the universities of Florida and Minnesota. In addition to being a leading researcher and academic in the wildlife sciences, Dr. Karanth has been active in conservation practice and advocacy by leading non-governmental conservation efforts, as well as a practicing engineer and farmer during the early parts of his career. He has served on various statutory bodies of the government, the Forest Advisory Committee, the Indian Board for Wildlife, National Tiger Conservation Authority, Wildlife Institute of India, as well as the species Survival Commission of IUCN. In recognition of his conservation work, he has received several awards, including the Karnataka Raja Prashasti, the Presidential Honor Padma Shri, the Paul Getty Award, and the George Schaller Award, and the Fellowship of the Indian Academy of Sciences. Welcome, Dr. Karan. Dr. P.J. Dilip Kumar has served the Indian Forest Service between 1974 and 2012, retiring as the Director General of Forests and Special Secretary, Government of India. He's the only Kannadika so far to hold that apex position. He, he completed a master's degree in plant chemistry from IIT Mumbai. Thereafter, following his passion for wildlife, he joined the IFS, later completing a doctorate in forest economics from the University of Wales. Dr. Kumar has a deep interest in complex issues of forest resource use and governance. He chaired the Forest Advisory Committee of the Union Government, of which Dr. Karanth was also a member. And during its tenure, the committee effectively regulated many mining and hydro dam proposals, as well as introduced ecological scrutiny of wind and solar power projects from a wildlife perspective. In the academic domain, Dr. Kumar has been a senior fellow of the Indian Council of Social Science Research based at the, Indian, at the Institute for Social and Economic Change. Dr. Kumar has distilled his academic and practical experiences in the form of various papers and monographs, as well as a trenchant popular blog, blog format on current affairs, continuing to engage with forest governance issues. Welcome, Dr. Dilip Kumar. P.M. Muttana from Kushal Nagar, Kodagu, graduated with a Bachelor of Arts, followed by a degree in law, developing a passion for issues of human welfare and community organization. This ultimately led him to journalism and a fascination for the cause of wildlife conservation. 
he then set about integrating his passion for human welfare with pragmatic conservation, specifically focusing on forest dwelling and fringe communities in the Malnad region. After 2000, Muthana read, led the, the progressive voluntary relocation projects initiated by Dr. Karanth under the WCS program and later under other institutional affiliations. Additionally, Muthana and his team have worked with national agencies and state forest officials to assist anti-poaching and wildlife trade control work. He has served on several state and district committees of the government. To date, his efforts have led to voluntary re relocation of over 2,200 forest dwelling families in the Malnad and Wayanad regions. Currently, he's also, he also works on the wildlife conflict mitigation issues in collaboration with Dr. Kriti Karant at the Center for Wildlife Studies. We welcome you, Dr. Muthana, uh, Mr. Muthana. <laughs> with that, I hand over the podium to Dr. Karant for his initial remarks, and uh, please take over the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram, for that nice introduction. Uh, last, the first of the series was about wildlife science uh, and how it can be applied for conservation. And this one's about uh, actual conservation. Now, the first one was full of equations, and I think it terrified a lot of people, so I think the audience has shrunk by half. This time I brought pictures. So I'm again going through a couple of definitions. Uh, wildlife is a widely misunderstood term. It's applied to street dogs, your, uh, some cute animal that you love in the zoo, the, the pigeon that you feed. No, it's none of those. Wildlife has a very specific technical definition. When we say wildlife as professionals, we mean terrestrial. That means land-based, not oceanic or marine free-ranging, that means truly wild, not being fed or held captive, free-ranging vertebrates, that is animals with the vertebra. So conservation also has a wider definition. Conservation primarily, of course, is recovering species, uh, saving endangered species, arresting species loss, but it has other dimensions also. Uh, because it has a component of damage control, like what happens when people are harmed by wildlife. So conservation science and conservation practice has to address this. You can't say, let the tiger keep on eating people. No, that's not conservation. Then there is use. Many species of wildlife are used, not so much in India, and not in so many obvious examples, but inland fisheries is a very good example. People do use wildlife. So there is non-consumptive use also, like wildlife tourism is an example of non-consumptive use. So all this is captured by the definition. So now why should we say, I'm, this is not the theme, but I am just saying why of conservation is, there are utilitarian reasons, direct use, human welfare, aesthetics, like a national park, but there is also, I believe, an ethical basis that other species have a right to live. So it's a species level morality at some point, not at directed at individual animals. So humans have had a lot of impact on wildlife. We often don't know how powerful our impact has been. Uh, Bill Rees, who came up with the concept of uh, human footprint, the hum uh, it's kind of a, grand vision of uh, what we have done to the planet. And he has some very interesting estimates. I always repeat them in these talks because they are very, very striking. Uh, if uh, we are three lakh years old, human beings, and three lakhs years ago, if we had gone and weighed all the human beings and weighed all the other mammals in the world, human weight, uh, the biomass of humans would have been 1%. 99% would have been other, other wild mammals. Then, as we progressed 10,000 years ago, we invented agriculture and animal husbandry, domesticated a dozen species or so. And if you took the same snapshot 10,000, 15,000 years ago, 
the biomass of domestic animals and human had risen to 30 percent. 70 percent was still wild. And if you look at that figure now, it's 97 percent human and domestic animals. I'm not just saying human alone, all are the species that we have with us in abundant numbers. So the wild has shrunk to about 3 percent. So if you are serious about conservation, these kind of things have to be considered. We cannot pretend that people don't have any effect on wildlife or we cannot pretend that if we go far back in enough time, we'll send a solution where everybody happily lived together. No. So we are at this juncture and what we do now has to be based on this reality. So humans, we evolved as apes, but we are not vegetarian apes. We evolved as meat-eating apes. And we have all, uh, always been... So that's a terrestrial free-ranging vertebrate. And we have had impacts on habitats. The first thing is when you have human beings going beyond the forest into creating savannas by burning them in, at some point, but more importantly, through agriculture, we have transformed the land tremendously. So agriculture has a 15,000 year old history, 10 to 15,000 years. So it's not new. This idea that the modern man is a monster who is destroying wildlife and before that there was a wonderful time when that wasn't true is not true. We simply took over for our needs. It's, it's not a crime. It's simply the fact that we do need spaces for things like agriculture. The other thing is other forms of dependencies on the wild nature. For example, the enormous number of livestock. If you look at a wild species of bovid like gaur, the density is about four of, in the best habitats, four or five gaur per hundred square, kilo, per square kilometer. You go to any, any of the rural landscapes, we are talking about 80, 90, 100 cattle per square kilometer. So this kind of other biomass extractions in the form of resin, whether it's uh, firewood, whatever. There's a lot of impact we have. And we have always been hunters. The idea that just because some of us Indians are vegetarians, we are always, we keep eating cucurbits and nothing else is not true. People have hunted mammoths, people have hunted mastodons, and there's enormous paleontological report to show that as humans colonized North America and new continents, they just wiped out species. I'm not saying they're wrong. It's simply a fact that we are a, if we are a language, we learnt language, we learnt coordinated hunting, we learnt knowledge of hunting, transmission through generations. We became the master predators, wiping out everything before us. And this was prehistory. And this is well recorded. Then in historical times, we had more skills. We acquired... Uh, warfare skills, we are marshalling domesticated animals, horses. So we became even more in, uh, capable as hunters. And th these are the examples of the kind of hunt that we had all over uh, from Central Asia, Genghis Khan down to India and the Arabian Peninsula. After that, there was a significant change. Two, three hundred years ago, the Industrial Revolution and just before that, steel and gunpowder, two important inventions. So with the help of these, our impact on wildlife was even more uh, strongly multiplied. So after that uh, Mughal era, uh, we, we did an estimate, a very crude genetic estimate of, uh, uh, based on the molecular DNA clocks, Omar Ramakrishnan and some of us worked and Actually, there are probably about 300,000 or more tigers in India at that point in time, before the Mughal, Mughals arrived with their first set of skills. Now, once the colonials arrived with the second set of skills, there was really a further mass elimination of animals. And uh, you can see the elites are not necessarily white. There are also other turban-wearing guys. So, there was this pressure on wildlife with every step that we advanced as humans. And, you, uh, and we started using a combination of modern technology and our own ancient animal husbandry skills. Like the domesticated elephant is a very Asian phenomenon. 
but we use domesticated elephants, modern guns and hunting tactics to increase the rate of slaughter. So again, there is a tendency on the part of conservationists to say it was all the elites, it's the elites who did it, it's not, uh, not ordinary people. Ordinary people are good people. That is not true. The subalterns, all the people that you see sitting on the mahouts or whatever, they may not have organized this hunt, but they were also massively hunting wildlife for the simple need of protein, free protein and uh, uh, other medicinal values, uh, uh, putative or real. So once you get into this level, after World War II, the pressures even mounted. We had dry cell batteries. You could blind animals by flashing torch lights. You had jeeps which would go to remote areas, which we didn't have. So every step of the way, we have had a huge impact. So reversing this is not simply giving a slideshow and telling people to stop it. The, so this is serious. Uh, so I'm just showing very briefly in the form of very crude pictures of how our ability to impact wildlife has increased over time. And a lot of this was still not trade driven. But about 150, 200 years ago, Trade got into the picture as global trade, navigation, all these improved. Among the products that went was also uh, animal products. All of the American West was explored. Buffalo, the most common animal, was wiped out basically to uh, commercially send the meat by train load to the east coast of America, which was being colonized. The same thing happened here. The uh, oriental medicine trade, the uh, fur trade in Europe, all that converged on the same species. And uh, trade brought in people with traditional skills, giving them better income. So they became effectively one end of the supply chain. We don't realize that when you say, oh, that poor hunter is cooking for his meal. No, he's one end of the supply chain that reaches all over the globe for multiple species. Then we came the industrial phase of industrial growth, mines, dams, uh, really modifying the earth so it could support more people. And in India, this was pretty dramatic because we had a huge population to start with. The forest products, for example, which were used for commercial, uh, household use, suddenly found global markets. It was not just teak and sandalwood, it was also garcinia, which is used in pharmaceuticals, uh, agarbatti, which is bark of a tree, there was wholesale ripping off of the forest to meet global trade. I'm not saying these are evils. All I'm saying is this is normal economics at work and human welfare at work. So this is the stage that I kind of arrived on the scene. I was born in 1948 and pretty much everything looked like it would vanish because I'd spent the uh, from my teenage years wandering in the forest of Malna, trying to see a tiger, trying to see wildlife, going out with hunter in the ho hunters in the hope that I'll see wildlife, but everything was receding and things would have gone completely. So this is something modern, particularly young people is un uh, interested in wildlife don't understand. There was a dramatic phase in the late 60s and early 70s that changed the picture which I didn't believe. I, I would not have believed if somebody had told me at that point in time. The first generation conservationists in India, people like Salim Ali, Billy Arjun Singh, Dulip Matai, there are many of them, P.D. Stracy, they all reached out and said, we have to save wildlife. This was in the 50s and 60s. There were earlier, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, actually one Indian Forest Service officer, F.W. Champion, who is well known for his photographs was the first one to talk about the threats to the tiger. This was in the 1930s, so there were. But this was fi finally an articulate group of middle class Indians pleading for conservation. And luckily that found resonance in our prime minister at that time. Uh, uh, she gained power, not only she gained power, she was tough, ruthless, whatever her other qualities were, she, she could uh, get things done. So there, were, and she had a genuine empathy for her life. She really was interested in nature as a, maybe her father's influence, whatever it was, she was a driven woman as far as this was concerned. She cracked the whip. Now, around the same time, similar policies had come 
broadly wildlife policies in rest of Asia. But uh, nothing changed there because, see, you ultimately need, you can have a passion for conservation, you can have a strong political leader, but who implements it? None of the countries had the implementation capacity. The law enforcement capacity didn't exist on ground. People like deputy commissioners may seem very powerful, but the ten acres of land is encroached, there's nothing he can do. There's only a village accountant who will watch and record change of crop pattern. Luckily, we had the forest service. We had the forest department, not so much the forest service, forest service. We had some very interesting people in the, in the system who pleaded for saving nature. And one of them remarkably was from Karnataka. He was an assistant surgeon in Shimoga Megan Hospital called Cleghorn. He was, he had started a society for nature conservation in Scotland. He was pleading for conservation. There was a botanist called Gibbs in Bombay Botanical Garden. All these people put pressure on the British government to create reserve forests. It doesn't mean take away everybody's land, but set aside at least 30% of the land as a government forest estate. Don't let it be cultivated because the population was rising and the forests were being cleared. Uh, even uh, priceless forests in Malnad were uh, uh, burnt annually. Kumri cultivation it was called. So this led to the creation of the uh, forest estate, roughly a third of the land. And this was actually resisted very strongly by Munro, who was the resident of South India, as well as the British military, uh, the civil service saying, uh, you know, there'll be one more mutiny. But anyway, the land base was created because of the vision of those people. Today, you can say they looted the country, all that is true. But they did carve out this piece of land that we call reserve forest today, and for very selfish reasons, uh, timber for the Navy, railway sleepers, whatever. But that is the land base on which we have conservation today. So, this uh, actions of Indira Gandhi, Wildlife Protection Act in 1972, uh, Forest Conservation Act in 1980, uh, and um, later one, 1984, Environment Protection Act, these created a structure and we had a department that had the muscle to enforce it. And those days, it was not like the IAS, like it has become now. It was really men in khaki who went out, in, incredible people. I was fortunate, my, towards the early part of my career, I saw many of them. And uh, so the wildlife started coming back. And we had even tigers recover substantially to the degree that you could even uh, go to some of these places and watch tigers. This transformation, I was an eyewitness from that dismal state in 1962-63 to by 1974-75, we had brought back. Not everywhere. If you look at the map of India, it's very clear. Where there was a reasonable administration, there was an authority to enforce the law in some form, this happened. If you went to Chhattisgarh or Jharkhand or uh, vast parts of Orissa or almost all of eastern India, where there was no such structure in place. The communities managed the land. The presence of uh, law enforcement capacity was nil. There the wildlife got wiped out. 1955 tigers were eliminated from Nagaland. These states had enormous forests. But the fact is, if you don't have law enforcement, people will consume wildlife, people will trade in wildlife. So, the recovery was not everywhere, but it did happen in important areas in South India, Central India, Western India. And so that to me, that phase lasted from about 1974 to about 2000 or so. And I was very much involved in that process, not as an uh, active I was not a government servant, but I was very much engaged with them through all these processes. And I saw people like Mr. K. M. Chinnapa, Mr. Shamsundar here in our state, who, who many who contributed to this. So this is this history is not well recognized. So you get this history written about non-existent things that didn't happen. So, but something changed in the, I think around 2000-2005. One I think was the creation of a 
there were arguments that this model of fortress conservation that you protect and not worry too much about anything else was wrong and you had to address the needs of local communities which is a very le legitimate thing so but where we went wrong i think was that uh, in the 19 uh, around uh, 2000 or a little before 2000 world bank came with what is called eco development pro idea of eco development that is these people managing the parks should also start helping people it all sounds good but the way it happened so some of us were participants sanjay debroy one of india's additional secretary forest at that time very charismatic conservationist he i and uh, valmik tapar went and pleaded with the world bank not to bring this project because its fundamental thing was it will bring 30 times it will inflate budgets 30 times to the parks where it was targeted this is a bad idea in india to just give somebody 30 times more money you know what happens i don't want to go into all the gruesome details but you know what happens when there's too much money in the hands of people the second thing was Forest department's job was tough as it is, guarding the forest, facing poachers, stopping timber smuggling. They were also given these additional tasks of being nice to villagers, buying water buffaloes, uh, helping them grow sericulture plants. The work that was already being done by other government's arms. So what this did was it destroyed the sense of purpose and mission and it diverted attention to non-essential activities and it also, the inflated budgets caused such an impact that the best people who used to be guardians of wildlife wouldn't even get these postings because these budget, this big budgets were in these postings. So I saw that transformation and so any stories about how wildlife has been done wonderfully after 2000, I'm somewhat skeptical. And that's reached a stage now where in the name of eradication of uh, Lantana, vast stretches of forests are being cleared, uh, water holes dug. These are manipulations. In the previous talk, I described how it is like putting together or maintaining a clock. Every measure you take has to be science driven. It's not meant to be for spending money. Uh, but unfortunately, this is the direction in which a lot of this is happening. And one of the consequences have been that some of these manipulations have led to extremely high densities of animals, more than what the natural forest should have. 10 to 15 times more than uh, what the natural forest should have. And then you have conflict naturally because these animals are, um, you know, spreading predators are, are dangerous. So this, uh, this is another phase. So this is kind of the brief history now we are at a point where we have only 4% of the land in protected areas. 10% of the intact land under government owned reserve forest. And even within this, there are enclaves of people. And what has happened in this period is from the time I was born to today, life expectancy has gone up from 30 to 64 years. Incomes have multiplied 15 times. And people desire prosperity, they seek material prosperity. You, this cannot be denied. So what we are doing is now taking development into these remote areas. So once you know that a 600 square kilometer forest in pristine condition, if had Samana dwelling, hunters probably would have had 10 or 15 people or 20 people. Now we have 300 people, 400 families. How do you support it? They can't live off the land. It's a myth that subsistence hunters can live on 600 square kilometer parks, 4,000 of them. No way. No science can support that argument. So we started reaching out to people. But we also saw one thing, as uh, particularly my teammate, Mr. Muttanna and others, we worked on the ground. We saw these people had the same aspirations that every rural person had. Education, better health care, uh, children being at a better job than themselves, road, all these aspirations. So in the face of every conservation, environmental, whatever, theoretician, we went and said, we will convince them to come out. And of course, Mr. Mutana played a leading role, but there were others also, Mr. Girish in Chikmangalur, all this was done. So we went about very systematically. 
there was no interest in the government initially but as we started working at least some of the good officials came to our side and they started cooperating because they had the authority to do it we didn't we could support them and then uh, money started uh, coming for relocation initially we had to help with some funding but uh, particularly uh, in uh, in the after 2010 there was a burst of activity as uh, Uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh got very interested in this idea, and uh, he saw the phenomenal success of these. Not one family wanted to go back. It's hard work. It's not easy. It's very easy to sit here and preach. So, as a consequence, this moved forward, and that has been one of the very successful efforts. Nearly 2,200 families have moved out of the landscape, but unfortunately, because of the earlier problem I talked about of too much money and uh, collapse of administration this has sort of collapsed in karnataka but other places have taken up madhya pradesh has done phenomenally in this just because of the interest of local conservationists and a few forest officers and ias officers maharashtra has done pretty good we were leaders but we have now lagged behind so the other thing that comes up will as a part of the discussion will be the tourism now there are people who say tourism is all bad tigers like to be left alone or uh, uh, my point is this you need to create some interest in wildlife in the public and if regulated and done properly tourism has a role in it and far more importantly for me if these 3% protected areas have to become 10% or expand further there is no government owned land it has to expand on to private land and the best way to expand private land is through making the farmer switch to wildlife this has happened in other countries in south africa where people have found they make more money from having wildlife and tourism on their land they switch and then automatically the hostile neighbor becomes a friendly neighbor the, we have tried anything in this direction it's complicated because land holdings are small but we also have enormous economic power of tourism our middle class is 300 million strong and very powerful and this is not a foreign tourist who will disappear at the sign of the first virus they will be here they are local tourists so this is something we have done anything about again a lack of vision both in the government as well as the tourism industry so we can bring back wild nature i think there are ways to do it and we can't go into all the themes today uh, because it's a very complicated topic and in my next uh, uh, third series i will talk about some of the externalities of this which i haven't gone in but this one i wanted to again focus on this particular topic because i have two very good people here with me Dilip who was one of the most outstanding foresters I have met in my career and with him at the helm of the India's forest those were the days I feel about how we regulated projects how how the how it was a break on development not that you don't need the engine but it does need a break see and uh, Mutana who has worked at Grassleaf but the, the, this picture in some sense is we need that forest that I showed but at this stage with 1.4 billion people we can't have that forest if we don't have this so one of the things that development brings is it urbanizes it draws people away from nature uh, dependencies not so much nature and dependencies extracting more for nature cannot be a solution i talked about that 99% lot of conservation solutions are about extracting more that's there's no room there is no resource base to extract uh, to support a 1.4 billion population with aspirations middle class aspirations uh, lower middle class aspiration rural poverty has come down dramatically people don't believe it i have seen rural poverty food riots were there so development is necessary but how do we balance the two is really the issue and there are some ideas which i won't this is not the subject of this session but in the next one i am going to talk about it it boils down to two things energy gdp growth everything is tied to energy being cheap energy 
Second thing is efficient agriculture. And so rejecting technology, whether it's nuclear power or biotechnology, will not get there. So we do need to use technology to decouple from nature. There is no way we can get off this, say, stop the planet, I want to get off, you can't. So this is the way forward, but that's the next kind of wrap up that I'll give of all three talks. But this one is uh, pretty much what I wanted to say today. And uh, with that, uh, we start, I move there. Okay, so with that, I invite my colleagues to. So basically, I, I would like to say a few things about them because after that, the burden is on them. Uh, we go back to 1970s, he joined for a service. It's been, he's, who, he's somebody I have watched and who has always stood for principles. He has stood up to some mighty chief ministers who are ex-chief ministers in my presence with a polite smile, but he stands up. And on the committees that we were in, we had some incredible opportunities because we had to sit on some of the largest hydro projects in Uttarakhand, mining projects, and we made the case and we, we were able to win. We were able to convince the minister that, and that was largely Dilip's contribution. And lastly, when we were on the forest advisory committee, windmills and solar power and micro hurdles had no environmental clearance needed. They were considered green, but you saw the damage they were inflicting. So we put in strong environmental clearances are required today for all even so-called green, green power. So we have worked together. So it's a pleasure to have Dilip here. And uh, Mr. Mutanna is a different kettle of fish. Uh, this was in 1999. He was running a newspaper called Malanadu Varte, which was a pro-people, sort of pro-wildlife um, tabloid, very aggressive tabloid. He came to interview me and I was thinking, who is going to take care of Nagarhole and its advocacy as we all grow old and fade away? And the answer stared me in the face. So I convinced him to, not him, I couldn't convince him, but his mentors came, Chinnappa and Tamu Puaya. I convinced them, look, spare him for conservation. So we made him shut down his tabloid and he joined my team. And he is the most insightful person. I, I can put him against three PhD sociologists and he'll beat them. His insights of how a society functions, has genuine empathy for forest people and their genuine problems. That's why I'm delighted to have Mutarna here also. So I will start with the question for Dilip. You have seen, you know, this is a tough one, but I'm sure. You know, you have seen the giants who inspired you in the forest service. You were inspired by some pretty impressive people and you have inspired a generation. But when you look at the scenario today, you know, it's not true only of forests, but also of police, of IAS, everywhere we see a kind of a decline. Based on your enormous experience, what, how do you think we can bring back that collaboration between the bureaucracy and the non-government sector in a transparent way that we were able to do that for so many years? Thank you very much, Ulas. Uh, I mean, I say what a pleasure it is to be with you at Mr. Mutana and this very uh, august gathering here. I, I, I wonder whether there are some people who are interested in actually working in the field in wildlife. Uh, I do hope so because this is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, when I joined the Forest Service in 1974, very interesting background to that. I was doing my MSc in chemistry in the IIT Bombay, but uh, I was always interested in bird watching and uh, wildlife and so on. In fact, I wrote to Mr. Adkoli, who you know and you know also, uh, when I was uh, in uh, college, saying I'd like to become a keeper in your Delhi Zoo. He was the director of the Delhi Zoo, because I had read about uh, people going to Whipsnade Zoo and becoming keepers and 
No, I had that idea that somehow in India, in 1970, in the 1970s in India, wildlife was not such a big thing. Uh, bird watching was a sort of uh, only, only eccentric people did bird watching on the campus. So, Mr. Atkoli was kind enough, uh, Ullas, to write back to me saying, please finish your BSc. And after you finished your BSc, you can think of doing something. Maybe you can keep this as a hobby. So, today, uh, youngsters have got enormous opportunities uh, to get into a career in wildlife. In fact, it's very embarrassing to us foresters because uh, you are fantastic photographers, you are great naturalists. There is a whole volume of women in uh, natural history in India. So, there's been such a change, Ullas, that uh, I definitely am not one of those persons who says that things have deteriorated because this is a very long and complicated process. So, now there is a huge uh, public which is interested in wildlife and they're highly educated. Now, even if you go to the villages, I remember going to Tamil Nadu to a village uh, in one of our visits. So, we asked, uh, the, they, are, they are sitting like you are sitting here, you know, uh, and we are talking to them. And all the little girls are sitting in front and they are the ones who are talking. So, education has uh, played such a huge role in, in the rural areas. You educate the girl child and you can achieve so many of your objectives. So, we asked them, uh, are you going for firewood to the forest? No, sir. Who goes to the forest for firewood? Uh, we don't have the time to go for firewood. We have to study. We have to do well in our studies. Uh, so, the amount of grazing in the forest has gone down or at least had gone down in Tamil Nadu because of the social forestry program. When I joined the service, uh, there was a huge antagonism between the community and the forest service, forest department. Uh, I was sent to a division in Badravati, that's in Shimoga district. Uh, their whole villages were indulging in smuggling. And uh, every village had huge stores of teak. There were teak under the houses, there were teak in the ponds, there were teak in the uh, fields, everywhere they had... Uh, buried thousands and thousands of teak logs. And you know, Badravati Shimoga is one of the homes of teak. The best teak grows there. And the staff was completely demoralized. So I, as a youngster, just thrown there. I uh, didn't know a damn thing about what to do with it. But I found that people are just stealing the forest. So I said, no, we can't keep quiet. So we organized ourselves. We got the police to help us. Uh, DAG Berman, he was a very famous fo police officer in uh, Karnataka, he came. Uh, then at 6 o'clock in the morning, he's saying, what happened, Dilip Kumar? Nothing is moving. Where's your force? Where are the jeeps? Where are the uh, trucks? Uh, do you think you can really go through with it? So I told him, I just got up. I didn't even have a shave or anything. Half asleep, I said, no, sir, we're going. So we went off to the village. And the thing about that was that you, of course, have to take action against the poaching and the smuggling. But you don't take action against the people. So, we didn't book a single case. Uh, of course, my superior officers were very surprised at that. They said, all this criminal activity, you have not booked a single case. I said, no, we just take back our teak. We instill a sense of uh, pride in our staff. We give them some teeth. So, the learning that I have is that if you want to protect the forest and the wildlife, you have to have the community also involved. You have to talk to the community and the community has also to be let us say, modernized a bit. Uh, as Ullas very rightly said, you can't just depend on agriculture and uh, uh, poaching or uh, bush meat. You have to have other skills, you have to have other employment opportunities. So that is happening in the countryside. Uh, if you improve education and health in the countryside, you're going to get this progress. The other side is that you must have institutions and uh, Ullas appreciates this. Thank you for recognizing also the contribution of the forest department. The mistake many environmentalists in the country made was that they said the source of all ills is the forest department. But Ullas, because he had worked with forest officers, senior forest officers in his youth, and he was trained by them, he was mentored by them, he understood that it's a huge challenge in the field. It's not like a textbook that you can go in and apply one, two, three, four. There is no standard operating procedure there. Uh, every community is different, every situation is different and you have to respond to it. So, the sum and substance of it is you have to have 
nested institutions that the community can function if it is uh, nested, if it has good connections with other institutions, government departments, the legal system, communications, the media, and so on. Uh, finance sources of finance, uh, uh, marketing opportunities, technology improvement, all those things which Ulla has talked about. So it has to be a series of nested institutions. Community works within this nested, uh, uh, within this hierarchy. Community cannot be an isolated sort of thing working and setting up its own utopia. Uh, these, these utopias don't work. So this is the learning I have had. And as far as the forest department is concerned, you know, technology changes, now drones are there, the remote sensing is there. So when we joined, of course, and even now, uh, foresters worked by the seat of their pants or the soles of their boots, as we say. But you know, the funny thing about wildlife is you walk in the forest, you don't see a single damn animal. I think so rarely I've seen animals walking in the forest, but because we are foresters, we have to walk. Now, so much technology is there to monitor and uh, assess the state of wildlife. We have to keep with the time. So perhaps the younger generation knows how to do these things. They don't listen to us. Uh, we cannot advise them, but they have their own challenges and I'm sure they'll meet it. So Ulas, I, I think that I have a lot of hope in the future because the forest department, the forest service has a very good idea of its own importance, its own significance. Uh, I know it does a job under very great uh, limitations, a lot of pressures, but they do have a sense of mission. Uh, so these are the learnings which I have uh, shared with you, I would like to share with you. Thank you very much. One of the things I would like to point out, which he brought out in his conversation is the very need for law enforcement has except in the case of valuable species and of course in the place where anarchy reigns. We are talking about the forest we are familiar with. The switch over to LPG from wood driven by increased incomes, switch over to domesticated protein in the form of chicken and other things compared to eating wild meat. Again, because of increased wages and availability of farmed chicken using modern poultry methods and massive switch of uh, transportation. All the tilling, all the haulage was done by livestock. So once that became mechanized, the number of livestock has dropped. So there were external factors that have made it easier. So the kind of situation they faced or the previous generation faced is much milder uh, situation now showing that it can't only be law enforcement, it also has got to be economic development is not just the enemy of conservation, it also has a positive role in saving, protecting nature. So, to Mr. Mutana, one of the jobs you have done, which you keep very silent about and don't publicize, is that uh, through the various programs we have worked with the Crime Control Bureau, the Forest uh, sell forest departments locally, etc., has been providing information and supporting action till something happens and then supporting uh, the consequences they sometimes face. So can you give some accounts or the details of how NGOs because I'm asked this constantly. I'm living, uh, I'm in so-and-so place. What can I do for wildlife? So this is what what's anybody who is well informed, you can even give the example of uh, one of the people you, you know, what you can do to support law enforcement as a non-governmental person interested in wildlife. And here's that, uh, just to cite one more thing, when we had good cooperating officers in the department, over the years we would do a review out of the cases they have booked, uh, nearly 30 to 40 percent came from intelligence that we were able to gather in the villages through the community networks. This is because, you know, there is a veil of secrecy. If you are a part of the community, you can get that intelligence. 
uh, in 2000 when i joined this job so everybody used to tell that international wildlife trade is about some few billion worth it is third or fourth in the international illegal trade something like that but after working in field for a couple of years i realized that so whenever this reference came everybody referred uh, elephant being poached in african countries or something happening in uh, southeast asian countries but by 2002 i realized that this trade is happening in my backyard there was demand for each and every species parakeets were captured star tortoises were captured recently pangolins they are they are uh, searched every look and corner of the forest and outside it is captured and now after covid 19 there is demand for wild meat so it's happening at every level small hunter who was hunting for his house now he has become a trader there is a network using mobile phones once he get meat he calls his people uh, the connected people and it is sold within hours and you can't find any evidence as you know forest department although it looks uh, huge uh, they can't be everywhere at every time so working with communities and working with activists working with journalists this can be addressed to a certain extent that's what we have done in in the landscape of nagarwale bandipura vayanad uh, and so in every society there are good people who are interested about conserving conservation but there may be some issues of them directly approaching law enforcement a- agencies in the fear of exposing their name being exposed or retaliation from the hunting gr- groups that kind of things so if we can build that trust and we can play the intermediary role between the law enforcement agencies and this informers that is the best thing but for that we should be in that landscape for longer period that's what we have done we have uh, we are working with uh, around 50 to 60 uh, informers who are villagers who are good hearted people they don't go after they are not james bonds they don't go after uh, collecting informations it's happening in front of their eyes someone is going entering forest with a firearm someone is bringing spotted deer in in gunny bags just in he need to pick his mobile and he has to call someone who is trusted that's that can uh, if interested activists are there they can cultivate that kind of information network around every forest area now the other question was uh, you know when you give the information what happens what are the consequences and in some cases the stuff get into trouble yes uh, so it's over a period of time we have built in some safety mechanisms based on the experience so uh, to share information with a particular officer we have to have a background check whether he is interested in uh, processing that information whether he is capable of uh, riding that place whether he has got that jurisdiction that kind of background check we have to do then we will share that information with them so again the success rate is 10% by the time we we collect that information and uh, sharing that inf- information with the law enforcement agencies and the, by the time of their a raid there is a time gap of 1 to 2 hours by that time there may be no evidence if it is meat it can be completely sold if it is trophy it is available for longer period so uh, that uh, possibility is also always there uh, and sometimes some officers or uh, field staff they don't like uh, a third person sharing this kind of credible information say so they they think that their egos are hurt and these people are creating problem for us these people are questioning us that kind of issues are there they create problem uh, but uh, having contact at every level in the forest department in the police department helps us to tackle that situation
Dilip, I have a question for you. If we have to, uh, you know, for example, in, uh, in US Fish and Wildlife Service, other professional agencies, people entering the service are trained in the profession before they enter, like we have for medicine and engineering. Uh, it's been my feeling that we, it's time for us to move from this general UPSC recruitment model to the engineering or medicine model where you train somebody for four or five years and then recruit them into because these fields are all becoming um, in some sense more sophisticated. So what are your thoughts on that having kind of presided over a lot of the training programs? Yeah, I, I have a whole blog on this actually, Ulas, because in fact, when Jairam, Jairam Ramesh was our minister, one of his criticisms was that you guys are not scientists, you're not scientific enough. Now, it's a very complicated issue actually. Now, the problem here is that uh, it has been uh, a sort of land-based service, which means that actually they are, we are land managers more than forest managers or wildlife managers. Because uh, to protect land, it requires a different set of skills. Those skills are like a protective force or a police force or a strongman force. So a purely scientific person may not, not be successful in the field. So we, the forest department from the beginning, of course, they said that, you know, the British knew how to set up these services. So for the forest, they said, we don't want highly educated people. We want people who can walk in the forest, who are strong, who are, you know, fearsome, who look strong and who can control the people and uh, who have an interest in the outdoors. And those days, people who had interest in the outdoors were interested, I'm sorry to say, in hunting and things like that. Today, it's photography and trekking and hiking. But uh, they said that, you know, we don't want highly academic people, people like me and I don't know about you, Ulas, but I'm a nerd, you know, studying very well, and doing very well in exams. No, we don't want, we want good, uh, strong, robust people. So this was their policy. So they said, we'll not have very onerous examination systems. We'll interview them, we'll see them. We'll see they're good in sports and things like that. They're well connected, come from good families and we'll recruit them. So this was the way they tried to establish a, a force in the field, which could protect the land, the forests, and work with the people. That is, you've got to have a bonhomie with the people. So a purely academic person will not be successful, I can say that. A person who can sing songs with the community may be more successful in motivating the community, who has a cultural sort of mooring there, uh, who has a standing also. But also, this examination system uh, has helped a number of very ordinary people to get into these services. If you go and talk with the forest officers, the range officers, the guards, the, f the foresters and guards on the ground, you will find that many of them are from very poor families, rural families. Their parents may have been a driver or a uh, cook somewhere or uh, just a small farmer or a landless laborer. They may have been a bonded laborer also. So our, our education system is so good that in the schools, everybody gets a grounding of the three hours. Uh, and if, if, they, if they are a little serious, they can uh, pass these exams. So there are no pass. The other thing is that uh, it's, from the beginning, it has been restricted to science graduates. So to a certain extent, the social sciences have not been represented. Uh, in the service and women were not represented for a very long time because the British have said that you want rough and tough uh, field people like the army also you know. So only a uh, very uh, few decades back maybe in the 80s they started getting women in. Uh, so slowly it has been uh, civilized and uh, made more uh, sort of culturally appropriate. So now you are having a wider variety of interests and people who are interested in academic science and so on. Now. The way we uh, approached the problem was that if you have people who are actually trained in forestry in the universities uh, and they don't get jobs because the forest positions are 
restricted to say about 100 per year. Uh, then what do those graduates do? They cannot be employed elsewhere. And uh, if you have a number of such forest uh, colleges or universities or departments, uh, then they have to find jobs elsewhere. So our, our let us say the uh, catchment, catchment of uh, possible candidates shrinks so badly if you only have to restrict it to graduates in wildlife and uh, forestry. And forestry in the universities, I am sorry to say, I don't know, but it may not attract the best candidates because the best cream goes to engineering uh, the ne and medi medical and medicine. Then maybe the next one goes to science and so on and so forth. Today what is happening is that uh, the best engineering brains are applying for the civil service exams. When, when, I, was, when we, I was in Delhi, the UPSC also merged the uh, preliminary exam of the forest service with the general preliminary exam. So this was a good thing because the pool of candidates from which to choose became very huge. Uh, previously, in fact, a certain forestry colleges, college had captured most of the recruitment to the Indian Forest Service because they made forestry one of the papers. So there was a sort of, I don't know whether it was a conscious nexus or what, but uh, these papers went to some forest professor who used to mark them very high. And now the funniest fact is that the engineers, engineers who are ap appearing from IITs and NIITs and so on, for the civil service exam in the forest service, they are opting for forestry as a paper because the forestry gets marked very highly. Because the catchment is so small, the community is so small that a forestry professor is not going to mark down the forestry paper which comes to him. Uh, so these are some of the pitfalls in trying to restrict recruitment. India is one of the few countries, in fact, uh, where forestry uh, services are being filled by general candidates. But it is restricted to science. Actually, the technical thing is it is not restricted to science graduates. Uh, the qualification is that you should have had a science paper in your uh, undergraduate course. So if somebody had a BA with statistics, I personally feel he should claim that he can write the exam. So the result is that a lot of chemists and engineers and medical graduates and physicists in the forest service, there were not enough botanists and uh, agriculture graduates and no forestry graduates till the forestry colleges started and they started sending people to the exams. So they have been protesting that they should get a quota in the service. I think in Karnataka they may have a quota, I am not sure. But uh, definitely there was, no, there was no thinking that it should be restricted only to forestry graduates. Then you have agriculture graduates, horticulture graduates, pisciculture graduates, sericulture graduates. In Karnataka, for example, it's a very serious thing. Where do these people get jobs? Then we started the Indian Institute of Forest Management in Bhopal. The idea was that management concepts should get into the forest service through foresters who are trained in the IIFM in Bhopal. But what happened was ulta, the reverse of it. Uh, people became IIFM graduates and they could not find jobs because they have to compete in the UPSC exam. So they started getting jobs with, UP, uh, with NGOs, with agro industries, uh, with banks and so on. So this is a highly confused picture. Jaram Ramesh asked us to make the, science, uh, the forestry service more scientific. Then we made a huge list of all the PhDs and MSCs who uh, are there in the forest service. And you know the statement, those who cannot uh, become PhDs. Those who don't get jobs get PhDs. So those who don't get good postings go for PhD like guys like me and so on. So, what we told him was, let us do one thing. Let us catch these young uh, officers when they're young. And immediately after they finish their training in the forest academy, let's ask them to, let's ask a select few of them, the toppers, the best of the lot. You have your selection process. And we give them an opportunity to go and start their specialization in some field. And the most popular one is, of course, wildlife. So we call it the Hari Singh Fellowship. Hari Singh being one of those uh, eminent foresters you mentioned who had an access to Indira Gandhi and who pushed for conservation. Uh, in fact, he was responsible for reviving the forest service itself. 
So we called it the Hari Singh Fellowship. We sent them for one year for specialized training right after their uh, forestry training in the academy. And then we hope that later on they'll be set on the path to uh, professional career in that particular specialization. So we have across the world different models and the model that trained people do law enforcement also. So there's the law enforcement people. So the, much of the African wildlife management is a, in the US and Brazil. They manage that way. We have, and I think Malaysia has something like what we have. So, there is a different place, but I think we can, can I just add it? one thing is that my uh, recommendation would be that rather than making forest officers who have to be law and enforcement officers and uh, a number of other things in their field, it may be better to have support uh, staff uh, who are specialists like biologists and wildlife uh, scientists and so on, veterinarian. Our vet vet veterinary officers are so useful and successful. So I, I think we should push for something where there are collaborative. Uh, the problem is that the status and promotion opportunities have to be given to these non-forestry, uh, non-IFS people. Uh, for example, the Forest Research Institute in Dehradun, scientists used to also occupy the top positions. And there was such a good uh, report, you know, people like Narayan, Narayan, Narayan Murthy and uh, Kedar Nath, top uh, scientists, uh, world-class scientists, geneticists, entomologists and so on. They are all, they consider themselves as part of the forest hierarchy. So, Mutana, you have been involved in relocation projects around other projects, etc. Over time when you have, what are the factors where it has succeeded and been smooth? What are the circumstances where the work has been hard? So, for any project, working with the government is a tough challenge. Uh, for a poor tribal or forest dwelling family. No, no, you come to that. But okay. my question is, we have done it in Kutrabu, we have done it in Bhadra, we have done it in Nagarod, in different places. Why is it that there is a lack of the project forward? That's what I am coming to. So, the good officers posting at uh, district relocation in the district level and the field level the combination and uh, civil society organization these three uh, plays a major role now the relocation is being implemented by the district relocation committee which is headed by the district collector so if i compare different uh, relocation packages happening right from Kali, Kudremukha, Nagaravale uh, in Karnataka and Mudamale uh, in Tamil Nadu and Vainad uh, in Kerala. So the easiest relocation program I have noticed is in Vainad because whenever we speak about relocation program in, in Karnataka, it's always challenges. In Vainad, political parties the uh, same inaugurated the relocation program in front of 5,000 uh, people and that giving the benefit to a poor forest dweller is part of their policy. So now within uh, six years they have covered 800 families. In Nagarwala relocation program started in uh, 1999 still just 800 families about uh, 197 application is still pending. So uh, there are different things. And one best example is from MMLs, where 200 and plus families are ready to move out. The entire village is ready to move out. They are land holding families. They have 450 acres of land, but no one is staying there. Everybody is working as wage laborers in Bangalore. Due to elephant problem, they can't cultivate a single blade of grass. There is no primary school, no hospital. They have to travel 15 kilometers. For their relocation, they require about 40 crore rupees. To provide all these benefits in the same place, they require more than 400 crores. And the, the recurring cost is more. In spite of that, their, their demand is not met. So it, it varies and it depends on the officers 
and the political leadership and the NGO working in that area. This has been a huge problem because, uh, you know, there is a, what is called a compensatory afforestation scheme, when industries use up forest land, forest advisory committee, uh, in the list of things that, uh, you know, it's supposed to be, you're supposed to, because you're using forest, you're supposed to afforest it somewhere, get land, land, all that. But over time, it's found it's not uh, it's not easy to do that. So we made a particular effort to convince the environment ministers to put relocation in that. Suppose you are acquiring some land for an industrial purpose, an equivalent area or in some way uh, suitable area, appropriate compensatory form, you help in relocation and free up forests that are already under cultivation by uh, getting them alternate land through purchases. purchases. So there is a lot of money. Karnataka got 5-6 thousand crores of that compensatory forestation. And uh, although the provision is there, it's not been spent at all. None of, none of this is going for the primary purpose which would have paid. Instead it's going on buying equipment, more vehicles, more uh, drones, whatever. So the thing is, there is the money and there are people now willing to come, come out of the forest. Even large places, 500, 600 acres, people are not able to manage. Just, just the, uh, the culture has changed. People don't want to be there. This is a chance for even donors, big time, to chip in. And uh, this is what the Nature Conservancy does in the uh, US. They, they do that. Unfortunately, our philanthropists have not really gone into this in any significant way. You also project like that. Yeah, we, we, we tried to do that, uh, but it, it hasn't come through in a significant scale. Uh, the Kampa money is government money, it's held there. Uh, Supreme Court gave 15,000 crores for remediation of the damage of the Ballari mines. Not one crore has gone for relocation or anything. Once the money is in the system, it's spent on other things. This this is really where, as Mutana points out, unless the political class, the NGOs, everybody is vigilant, the money has a way of disappearing in our culture, unfortunately. So, I think we have about 20 minutes left. So we will now throw it open to the audience. Uh, do one thing. Uh, Direct the question at somebody, so we can. Uh, sorry. Th thank you so much for the enlightening talk and the discussion. Uh, Mr. Mutana, you mentioned uh, CSOs and non-profits and they play a significant role. Like, it, I'm just curious as to whether it's in the form of, uh, is it primarily through fundraising or like by providing skilled resources or like what specific kind of role do they play? Thank so, you. One of the issues is forest department is trained for... Uh, I didn't understand your question. Can you clarify? Sorry. Uh, uh, I'm curious about the role of uh, non-profits and CSOs who, who collaborate with public uh, organizations. Oh. What role, like is it primarily through fundraising or uh, providing skilled resources where uh, there is a scarcity or like what, how okay. do they actually okay. help? Yeah. Okay. So the forest department staffs are trained for protection work. So this relocation work requires human dimension. So that kind, that role can be played by an NGO. And they can, because uh, they are there in the same landscape. The forest particular officer is transferred within two years or three years. So institutional memory, he can play that role. Uh, and he can play the role of bridging uh, between the forest department or law enforcement agencies or the district relocation committee and the beneficiary. And also augmenting, see, if you have resources, uh, the government schemes are very tight. They will give for certain things and, but to make a person happy and settled and connected in a place, you need some uh, plugins in terms of, you know, what crops to grow, agriculture, better seeds, whatever. So there are multiple ways it can be done. Uh, so my question is to Mr. Mutana. Uh, you had told about um, uh, <clears throat> the government missionary 
uh, at different places how easy relocation has been in some places it's been tough uh, in from a community perspective in terms of community have you faced any challenges because you spoke about the the uh, ngos the the officers the bureaucracy and uh, the political people cooperating to uh, facilitate easy re relocation but have you faced any difficulties from a community level yes there are uh, some communities they are not ready to move out or there are some of the families they want to wait for couple of years so they they are uh, looking for better package all this decision of the individual family so we can't uh, have a program for the entire community so each family i have one example from kali he has got small kids the relocation package identifies uh, a 18 year above uh, girl um, as a individual family or boy as a individual family that family is still waiting there to because they are uh, youngsters so after 10 years they will be, be eligible and the unit size will be 5 so they will get uh, 75 lakh rupees so instead of taking just 15 lakh rupees or 30 lakh rupees they want to wait for that so that kind of because they are also uh, they think about their future and uh, we are no one to uh, force our ideology on them no, the, the key point is that it has to be voluntary. It should not be forced. Number two, it has to be a win-win in some way. And uh, one of the problems with the government packages, even the National Tiger Conservation Authority's relocation package said 15 lakhs. Now, a lot of people are happy with 15 lakhs if it's given to them and they can build their lives for themselves. What happens is it comes often with the caveat that X will build the house, Y, so they don't get liquidity at all. So sometimes it fails for that reason. And one of the things was we had private donors uh, in, in Kutramuk and we were trying to get these relocations going. And there were people who had encroached on land technically, although there is some paper pending that he may get the land. The government is very rigid because the finance ministry, different departments, so say he's an encroacher, he has no right. He stayed there for 30 years, he built a house, he's grown his family there. And you're saying he's an encroacher, he won't get compensation. So we chipped in there and we said, whatever the market value is, what you, we'll, we'll give it. So then the government had to just sign off on the paper, uh, sign on the sale deed when the transaction, we ensured a sale deed. So it's very complicated, it's not easy, but there are very many innovative ways the key is political backing, key is local officials cooperating and the constant turnover of people is a huge problem because one person is interested, he starts off, in Nagarola it happened, we had a fine here who built 350 houses, then there was some department politics and he got moved out and the whole thing didn't. So, you know, it needs to have a more autonomous kind of a structure, I think, with the forest department but not completely under the forest department. Uh, thank you all so much for the uh, interesting insights. I wanted to ask about do people aspire to remain? For example, would the community folks like a job in the forest department vis-a-vis -vis relocating and looking at an alternative job or opportunities? So, nowadays forest department recruitment is on, on KPSC selection process, even for the lowest job. So they don't get any uh, preferences. So even after, so Nagarwala has got 1,200 families as of now. They may, around 50 people may be selected out of 1,200 families. It's very negligible. Uh, so it, my forest department job may not be a solution for this. Um, sir, uh, Mr. Ullas, my question is to you. Uh, being a person li having lived in the urban spaces, my connect with uh, anything to do with forests is very, very surface level. Um, I've read one of your books. I went to the uh, Jungle Lodges uh, Nagarhole Sanctuary just last week. And we had the usual safari and all that. And we had the uh, great fortune of uh, sighting a tiger. 
my question to you is what do you think of these kind of models where tourism meets you know uh, where tourism is generating interest generating some income what is your take on these kind of models in a sense uh, it's it's right now the downside to it is there's too little area and too much too many people going there that's one problem so you get this crowding kind of thing i showed the second one is uh, in in the misguided idea that uh, this is a good thing habitats are being massively cleared you can see that in nagarhole when you go uh, in 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 the interest of artificially increasing animal numbers having more teeth more water holes see wild animals are meant to suffer stress and they will die if there is a drought they are not domestic animals that you have to feed water to with solar uh, pumps and all this whole idea of turning national parks or wild nature into some kind of a quasi zoo or a uh, you know that's the downside because that's but these are all solvable problems but the general idea that the exposure that people get from seeing wildlife it creates a constituency for culture which is the which is the positive thing and the other thing particularly wrong with tiger tourism you may be surprised that i'm saying it it's just detracted from people from other parts of nature everybody wants to go and see a tiger if you don't see a tiger like he's returning from a funeral you know who is sick in love what the hell everything is interesting in the jungle this tiger focus tourism is actually downgrading nature education by okay, uh, hello uh, thank you so much for uh, all the insights you have given i just wanted to uh, extend the conversation beyond reserve forest and forest department so in india we have a lot of land classified as wasteland generally these are grasslands and then there are uh, good species which are not as charismatic as tiger like hyenas jackal wolf uh, sometimes uh, leopards taking up this space uh, including black bucks and all so these species have been less talked about and uh, we do not general because again uh, under the shiny umbrella of tiger tourism they get lost so i would like to hear open question to all three of you i would like to hear your inputs on it yeah see this uh, if you look at uh, india's vegetation and uh, patterns <coughs> I talked about in my talk about the forest reservation and the big battle within the British civil service about carving out a forest estate. And that was centered around the fact that these forests had valuable timber, useful for railway, military, etc. Unfortunately, the drier areas in the plains, even within Karnataka or Tamil Nadu, you will see this. These areas had thorn forests. They were as outstanding naturally as any anything in the high forest zone. but that reserve forest creation process itself didn't happen and it, it's it's like 20 30% in the malna district it's not even 5% in some of the plains district now to bring back that is one one issue so the land base for them gradually shrunk as agriculture expanded the second thing is because of food shortages we have gone in for massive massive uh, uh, irrigation projects so Uh, the tungabhadra area was that's when the last cheetahs in karnataka were there so where tungabhadra dam is now see converting that into irrigated lands wiped out the complete land base for these kind of species you are talking about and the new assault on them is the solar and wind farms they are now occupying this they are tax holiday driven things which will not last in the marketplace any time but in the per pursuit of this trivial source of energy we are taking over very large parts of the dry areas it's a real tragedy i think even in uh, rajasthan it's the best place where you still have some in desert national park is the thousand pokhran where we test our underground nuclear test that but it's 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 a real issue now how can we even reverse what's going on let alone create more so the only hope is land use change in some way that if we don't need irrigation and if we can you know use 
better technology, biotechnology to not use so much water, not to, you know, in some way maintain it under drier conditions, probably some of these will have at least a bigger land use. But there's no hard answer. But this is where the wild app is in Africa, most of many of the places. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, this is to uh, Mr. Dilip Kumar. Sir, uh, uh, India has had uh, good examples of cooperatives in dairy farming, in organic farming. Are there any examples for uh, forestry cooperatives or collectives anywhere in India where both conservation efforts as well as local communities both have benefited? Yeah, you know, in the 1980s they started this experiment uh, of uh, co uh, joint forest management as you can call it. Uh, there are some communities which have done a very good job, but it depends on leadership uh, in the community. Everybody talks about Ralegaon Siddhi, for example, in Maharashtra. Uh, or in Karnataka, we had a few examples. There's a village in the Western Ghats called Bachgaon, where uh, they raised a whole series of plantations on the bol guddas, you know, the <coughs> denuded hillocks. And uh, uh, they, were, they were giving it out for film shooting and things like that. Uh, so they combine <coughs> things like tourism with uh, growing biomass and so on. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, as I said, uh, people are really uh, happy that uh, the community forestry programs brought in a whole lot of income generating activities apart from uh, growing forest crops. Uh, things like, you know, uh, man manure making, vermiculture, uh, uh, teaching them skills like computers, computer skills, and then savings and loan societies, uh, microfinance, uh, giving small loans for their seeds, giving, giving small loans for their small uh, shops, uh, tailoring, and a myriad of activities, so many of them mat making, uh, handicrafts, so many of them. So where, where they had the sort of integrated approach, it, it did work. But I think uh, what happens when outside funding dries up, then the interest uh, becomes less. So really, if you have good people with entrepreneurial skills, it can be made a success. And once again, the more number of agencies are able to uh, tap into this process, the better it is. The role of NGOs is absolutely important because NGOs have continuity. They have staff who work in that area for a long period of time. Uh, they are able to provide, uh, as Ulla said, uh, small things which uh, in the departmental scheme of things are very difficult to uh, provide. And uh, one of the ways is to get into a community and uh, meet the immediate needs. Maybe in some place a school doesn't have a roof or the children are not able to get to school because there's no transport and there are wild animals on the way. An uh, NGO can provide uh, small solutions for this uh, on the spot. So these are called confidence building, confidence building activities. And once the uh, community realizes that uh, there are other, other ways of making a living, uh, it will definitely have higher chances of success. As far as the forestry part of it is concerned, uh, what they found was that the community has to be consulted. If the forest department goes and plants eucalyptus there or uh, purely pulpwood, uh, maybe the community is not so interested because then the interest comes, uh, income comes to a uh, few people in the community and it may not percolate down to the individual families. So these are the learnings. Uh, the learnings have to be used. And definitely community organization cannot be done solely by the forest department. And a lot of other agencies have to pitch in. There, but there are good examples. I, I, I can even cite in wildlife, Periyar is an example where, according to what I have read, in the sanctuary um, volume on Periyar, for example, the whole thing is summarized. Though the GF uh, World Bank project was not well managed in Karnataka, as Ulla says, in Periyar they have reformed many of the poachers and made them into guardians of the Periyar sanctuary. So, tourism is a very good thing. Tiger, tiger reserves have a, a forum where the money is uh, plowed back into the area. Part of it goes to the community, part of it goes to uh, forest improvement. So these are the examples. We have time for one question. We have 
Uh, hello, uh, good evening, everyone. I think amazing insights from all of you had really provided, um, you know, sharing your experiences really provided that vivid picture um, into the wildlife. Uh, my question is open to, you know, anyone who wants to take it. Uh, where do we, what are your views on drawing that line between like man-made intervention or like human intervention, especially in wildlife, given like the context is changing so much of like ecotourism as some one mentioned so much of like for example in Kana National Park there are like these um, museums they are making inside the park um, where do you uh, see this uh, going and what are your views on that I think these natural areas as I showed have shrunk to such a small fraction of the land I think there's a place for all these things but not in these areas uh, I think there is room outside to do these things. I, I think we are cramming too many things into this. There is a natural balance there. There is a natural... And the, if I look at some of these forests, what they looked like 40 years ago and now, I can't recognize them. There is the, a chain reaction that happens. You clear a view line that you see in Nagarhole. What it does is, Every year you go and you clear. It started as a practice for fire tracing. Then it got expanded to 100 meter view lines. And over time, I have been going there from 1961 continuously. Over time, the view lines have become, uh, uh, the vegetation has been overgrazed because the chital numbers have shot up from 10 chital per square kilometers to uh, 100 per square kilometer. Weedy species have invaded this. The exposed trees have been damaged by elephants and suffered wind damage. So the whole landscape is changing. So I think these are very, very fine things that need to be done only if there is demonstrated need based on some careful research, you know, not random acts of violence against nature. With that, we come to the end of session two of this masterclass. I would like to thank Dr. Dilip Kumar, Mr. Muttana, and Dr. Karanth for anchoring this. May we please have a round of applause to appreciate their effort. Next Friday, which is the 19th of April at 6.30 p.m., we will have the concluding session of this masterclass on the externalities of wildlife conservation. Hope to see many of you back then. Thank you. Have a good night.